Tonight on the Daily Debrief. He also today has been um, displaying inappropriate laughter. In the middle of testimony, defense attorneys for a dad who threw his daughter off a bridge make an unexpected move that could derail the trial. We take you inside the courtroom and analyze new developments moment by moment. Plus, a babysitter on trial for allegedly battering a child, and she admits to striking the child and causing injury. Also, police identify a suspect in a Grammy-nominated rapper's killing. The nation's most fascinating cases are on the Daily Debrief. It's Tuesday, April 2nd. And good evening, everybody. I'm Michael Bryant in for Aaron tonight. Disruption mid-trial in the uh, defense attorneys who are trying to say now the Florida man accused of killing his daughter is not fit anymore to stand trial. John John Chuck is accused of murdering Phoebe John Chuck and by releasing her into Tampa Bay. The question really is whether the defendant is legally insane or whether he can be held criminally responsible. Prosecutors are trying him on charges of first degree murder, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and aggravated fleeing and eluding officers. Late this afternoon, John Chuck's defense attorney addressed his odd behavior in court and expressed concerns he may be having hallucinations. The judge ordered that John Chuck be evaluated by a court-appointed doctor, the one who's previously examined the defendant for competency. She said today John Chuck is competent, but the court is in recess until another doctor can evaluate the defendant, telling the judge that they have concerns about John Chuck's current mental state. So he also today has been um, displaying inappropriate laughter, which is a symptom that we have come to recognize sometimes when he does appear to be um, losing touch. He, um, and when we questioned him about that specifically, you know, you just seem like your mood is more elevated today. Or, you know, is, is that right? Is there anything going on? He had indicated that it was because we were making him laugh and that we were saying funny things to him, um, specifically Ms. McNeil and myself. And I, have only had conversation with him this morning, unfortunately, basically, good morning, everything go okay in the jail last night, did you get all your medications? I haven't even had a chance to really speak to him. Um, and additionally, Ms. McNeil had indicated that she also had not had really any small talk with Mr. John Chuck today. Um, he is insisting that he's completely fine um, and that he's not hallucinating. These are things that have actually happened. Um, so he is insisting that everything is fine. We certainly have some concerns at this point. A medical expert for the defense took the stand again today, and the prosecution extracted some quite damning testimony during cross-exam. This could hurt the defense argument in the long run. In September of 2014, he also heard the voices getting louder, right? That's when they initiated he reported. Now, he reported to you that in September of 2014, when the voices were getting louder, he noticed that when he was using drugs, that that had an effect on the voices getting louder, right? That it increased it, yes. That it increased it. What kind of drugs was he taking in September of 2014 when the voices were increased? Uh, he reported that he was smoking spice. And what else? Uh, he used crystal meth a couple of times. Now, as a doctor who's conducting your sanity evaluation, you have to eliminate drug use on the date of offense, correct? Yes. Because if he's on drugs when he commits the murder, then he's not insane, right? That is what case law says, yes. So something to keep in mind here, the police never actually tested John Chuck for drugs or alcohol. As the doctor's cross-examination continued, growing ever worse for the defense case, the doctor had this to say. If he is on drugs when he commits the murder, and that is what is causing the psychosis, if the drugs are causing the psychosis, then he's not insane, correct? Then I would not give that opinion. In your opinion, did Mr. Johnsha, the defendant in this case, know what he was doing when he dropped Phoebe off the bridge? Factually, uh, the information that I have is that he did have that information. He did have that appreciation. There it is. Defense witnesses saying that John Chuck had the appreciation and knew that what he was doing when he threw his daughter off the bridge was wrong. The defendant also reportedly once told a friend that he would claim insanity if he ever got into legal trouble. Melody Dishman reported 
that the defendant told her, her being Melody, that if he ever got in trouble one day that he would claim insanity. Correct? Yes, when he was 12 years old. Right. And he said that to her, according to her, when they were 12. Right? Correct. But at the time that you reviewed that police report, you didn't know how old the defendant was when he said that to Melody, right? Correct. You didn't know the context of that, correct? Correct. The many questions about whether Phoebe John Chuck's death could have been prevented. Remember, one officer who actually spoke with the defendant before Phoebe's death testified he did not have enough evidence to involuntarily commit him under the Baker Act. That's Florida's mental health law. I'll always kind of start off with, you know, do you, do you feel like hurting yourself or anyone else? Did you ask him that? Yes, I did. And his response was? No, he did not. Okay. What else did he was um, on that checklist? So I'd like to ask some questions like, um, are you hearing things uh, that you don't think are there or seeing things that aren't there? What was his response to those questions? No, he did not. Okay. So he was having other delusions or hallucinations that he told you? He, was, he, he told me he was not. All right. Go ahead. <coughs> Once he said no to those questions, the line of questioning uh, is pretty limited from there. I can only go what, off the feedback they give me. Um, Did he mention that he had any kind of mental illness? He said previously that he'd been uh, diagnosed as bipolar years back and that he'd been on medications, but he was no longer on those medications. Was he calm? Very calm. Coherent? Yes, sir. Responsive to questions? Yes, sir. At the end of that conversation, what occurred? I found that there was uh, no legal reason for a Baker Act, um, and he was free to leave. Okay. Did you speak with the priest at all? Briefly, for about five minutes. Was that before or after you allowed him to be released? After. Okay. Anything about that conversation with the priest that changed your uh, view of what you were doing? No, sir. Did you have an opportunity to see his daughter Phoebe that day? Very briefly. Okay. Tell us about that. Uh, they were walking out the front doors of the church. I saw them hand in hand. Uh, she appeared happy and waving, and they walked out the front doors of the church. And you felt comfortable letting him leave with her? Yes, sir, I did. Defense attorney Michael Bachner is here. Linda Kenny Bodden is here as well, also a, a long crime trial host. Welcome, folks. We have great, uh, great uh, panel here from the Jersey Bar, right? So let, let me ask you this. Uh, you know, this, this bombshell that came out today, let me start with you, Linda, uh, about whether the defendant is competent now to stand trial. We know he was incompetent for two years and found competent. This is like a ticking time bomb, right, this guy. Right, because it's going to be brought up, Michael, all the time now in this trial. And apparently what we learned is that he has been on a medication that he gets once a month by injection. And if it starts to wear off and he gets a little bit crazy, there's nothing they can do about it. So the defense is going to keep hammering on that. This is going to be a constant problem in this case. So uh, let me ask you, Michael, uh, how, do you, how do you get ready for the, the possibility that this is uh, you know, basically going to stop? It's going to end as a, uh, what, a hung jury and we have to start all over again if he is declared again incompetent? Well, if he's found incompetent, the law says that you can't go forward. So I, I think the way that things have been going so far is they're finding that these injections um, over the course of time have been keeping him competent. And I think it's going to continue with, the, with, with those findings. So uh, what's your gut feeling at this point in the trial, whether he is likely or not likely to be declared competent? We've had one doctor, the doctor has treated him all along, finding him competent. But now we're looking for another opinion. My feeling is they're going to find him competent, and certainly with the medication, that'll continue. That's, that's my guess. Linda, let me ask you, and this, this goes beyond the medical and right. even the legal to maybe the political. Here we are really getting close to wrapping up this case. Do you want to just throw that in the garbage? Are we going to just start this over? This is a tough decision for the judge to make. It's a tough decision. If I'm the defense, the way this has gone in, I would want to throw in the garbage because I don't get the feeling of the 27 commitments, Michael. I mean, clearly he has a problem. I don't even know right now. I couldn't make a decision whether or not he was insane at that time because I've heard that he's been committed to 27 times. For what? I want to know if I'm a juror. So let me ask you this. If, um, you know, we're hearing from people like the, the officer who didn't commit this man for the 28th time. Difficult position to put him in, a lot of responsibility. Uh, and now we're asking a jury to make a similar decision. What do you think, Michael? Well, you know, it, I, I agree with you. This police officer, I'm sure, is he's going home at night saying, oh, boy, if only I, maybe if I would have acted a little bit differently. But they only can, only can judge on what they have. And at the end of the day, we're not doing some thorough. He didn't do some thorough analysis. He didn't have psychiatric reports. He didn't really know all that much. And, you know, he only can do what he can do. But yeah. unfortunately...
And That's it seems it. to me, Linda, that you're, you're asking so much of somebody that is not equipped. And, and this is a mess up from the day one, all the years she's been born. We know that this child had interventions all the time. No one basically did anything. It is a true tragedy. It is a heartbreaker. Okay, folks, uh, we will back, uh, be back with the panel again before long here. But coming up, police are on the hunt for a suspect who allegedly gunned down a Grammy-nominated rapper. We'll bring you the details. Also, a babysitter on trial charged with murder, manslaughter, and endangerment. She told cops she hit the child, but her defense team says she didn't cause the child's death. That's after the break. The legal battle to clear R&B singer R. Kelly's name continues as his attorney goes to court and drags another celebrity attorney into the mix. Rachel Stockman has the latest on Kelly's legal drama. When you get in bed with fleas, this is what happens. R. Kelly's defense attorney in court Monday seeking to play offense. Steve Greenberg wants to shift scrutiny away from his client and on to dealings between Cook County prosecutors and controversial attorney Michael Avenatti. Greenberg filed a motion to require all communication preserved between prosecutors and Avenatti, who is representing some of R. Kelly's alleged victims. Right to a fair trial requires that they all be preserved at this point. Both Cook County State's attorney Kim Fox and Avenatti are under newfound public scrutiny and Greenberg is seeking to capitalize on that. We, we've already seen that, that State's attorney Fox has conversations with people about pending cases, pending investigations. I want to know what conversations she had with Avenatti about this case. Fox has been under fire for her handlings of the drop charges against actor Jussie Smollett. Allegations have been raised that she interfered on his behalf, despite claiming she had recused herself from the case. I don't think that the Jussie Smollett situation is going to impact uh, R. Kelly's trial. I think what it shows us is how this office operates. Avenatti is also facing his own legal trouble. He was indicted last week by federal prosecutors in New York and Los Angeles. He's accused of extorting sportswear company Nike and separately of embezzling funds from a legal settlement and avoiding taxes. Law and crime host and former prosecutor Bob Bianchi did not mince words. If these allegations are true, if this was done for the purest reason and the prosecutor is now compromised, they've compromised the very victims that they are sworn to protect. R. Kelly has vehemently denied the sexual assault charges against him. I didn't do this stuff. This is not me. I'm fighting for my life. Y'all killing me with this. The judge in Kelly's case did not rule on the motion. The next court date will be on May 7th and R. Kelly will be required to attend. A suspect has been identified in relation to the shooting death of the Grammy-nominated rapper. Uh, the police in L.A. have just informed us that they do have a suspect in custody. They're trying to confirm that it is, in fact, Eric Holder. He is wanted for that homicide related to the death of rapper Nipsey Hussle. He was fatally shot Sunday outside of South Los Angeles clothing store that he owned. Police say Holder and Hustle knew one another, and they suspect the shooting happened as a result of a dispute between the two men. Hustle was set to meet with the Los Angeles Police Commissioning Board and the Chief of Police, ironically, to discuss ways to uh, tackle the gang violence issues in the community. The cause of death has been released for a South Carolina college student who was murdered after she ordered an Uber but got into the wrong car. The South Carolina Law Enforcement Division says Samantha Josephson died from multiple sharp force injuries. Police say Josephson mistakenly got into a car she thought belonged to the Uber driver she requested early Saturday morning. Instead, she got into the backseat of a car driven by Nathaniel Rowland. He is now charged with her murder and kidnapping. Her battered body was found by turkey hunters in a field about 90 miles away. Police say there was blood found in Rowland's car. New details now in a state-issued report revealing missed opportunities to protect a child victim in a gruesome case. Victim Grace Packer was just 14 years old when she was raped, murdered, and dismembered by her adoptive mother's boyfriend, Jacob Sullivan. He admits to committing the heinous crime. A newly released Pennsylvania Department of Human Services report says investigators and child welfare workers missed a series of red flags and several opportunities to help protect the teen before she was killed. Jacob Sullivan is uh, sentenced now to death 
That happened last week. Sarah Packard, the victim's mother, has pleaded guilty to first-degree murder and has been sentenced to life without parole. A shocking new case out of Ohio about the babysitter who slapped, uh, has been slapped with multiple charges for the uh, injury and death to a three-year-old. Lindsay Parton is charged with murder, involuntary manslaughter, and three counts of endangering a child. The victim, Hannah Weshey, just three years old when she died, Parton was babysitting her when the young child reportedly dumped ketchup in the toilet, which could be considered a typical child behavior, a behavior according, according to the prosecutor. However, Parton allegedly decided to lash out, and according to the Butler County Sheriff's Office, she admits to hitting the child. Testimony began today, and the state called an emergency room doctor who examined the little girl. Here the doctor describes the injuries that the girl sustained. Page six at the top says right side mandibular area with ichemosis, superficial abrasion, contusion, and the chin appears with contusion, ichemosis. Okay. Contusion, what does that mean? Bruising. And I think you said ecchymosis, that's also bruising? Mm -hmm. So just two different words, or is there a difference between ecchymosis and contusion? No, just the same. Okay. And you also said abrasion. What are you talking about with abrasion? What is an abrasion? There's a breakage of the skin. Attempting to lay blame at the victim's father's feet. They say there is no way he could not have known about the injuries Hannah sustained. Here they question an EMT on cross-exam about statements Hannah's dad made when paramedics arrived at the scene. Testimony got pretty heated. We found multiple bruises all over patient's body. Patient has sunken in eye sockets, also bruised. All bruises in multiple stages of healing, correct? Correct. Okay. Patient's father on scene. Correct. And babysitter stated patient fell yesterday and hit her head hard and had complaining of a headache since the fall stated the babysitter, correct? Correct. All right. So this was a fall yesterday? That's what we were told. Okay. So when you just described the statement that you took about that particular day, mm -hmm. that's an error because you took a statement about what occurred the day before. Okay. Right? The history of this particular incident, not other medical history. Right. So this, the, the statement that we just read about a fall, and yesterday, and hitting head hard, that came from both the patient, or not strike that, that came from both Lindsay, the babysitter, correct? Correct. And the father? No. Okay, that just came from the? Patient's father on scene, and babysitter stated patient fell yesterday. I had simply said patient's father is on scene. Okay. So that was a statement that was attributed to her? Correct. Uh, and it was a statement that was made in the presence of the father? Correct. And the father didn't object? I don't know what he said. I wasn't focused on him as far as what he was saying to somebody else, just what he was trying, you know, saying to okay. us. You didn't hear him object? No. You didn't hear him say, that's not what happened? No, because he didn't know either. Okay. He told us he didn't know either. All right, so, so there was a statement from the father that's not in this report. Don't see where that's relevant. Okay, well, you don't get you don't get to choose what's relevant or not. <coughs> what I'm trying to <coughs> decide is strike that. You got one statement from Lindsay, correct? Correct. All right. You're now telling me that there were other statements that you heard from the father that aren't depicted in your report. These statements, he just told us that he's like, I don't know what's going on. Like, Okay. No, he didn't say much else aside from what you see where he said, you know, wake up, wake up. Where? In the narrative. Okay. What, what statement's attributed to him? The hovering over, just wake up, father continued to hover. Okay. Well, those aren't statements by the father. Those are behaviors that you observed, hovering and shaking. I said, just wake up. I didn't say shaking at all. He put that in my mouth. So things got a little dicey there in the uh, courtroom. Michael Bachner, Linda Kenny Bodden joined me once again. First of all, let me ask you, Michael, from a tactical standpoint, how much do you want to argue with a witness? 
Well, you, you try not to argue too much, but you do want to make your points. And uh, this lawyer did step into some good points. And uh, he was listening. A lot of lawyers, when they cross, just go to point number two. He heard this witness give him an answer, and he made hay out of it. Uh, I mean, guy left stuff out of the report. And Linda, the, uh, the EMT seemed a little defensive. Uh, well, just a bit. At the very least. Uh, and he tried to th object to a question he was presented with, uh, which never goes very well. But when you have a defensive witness like this, not a defense witness, a, a defensive, defensive witness, and, and he's, everything you say, he's challenging. Right. Uh, how do you deal with that? Well, you have to keep him under control. And this the defense attorney tried to do that. And it was interesting because I heard things listening that I didn't hear before, such as there were state bruises in her eyes that were in the various stages of healing. And yet the prosecution theory is that it happened just, you know, it happened today just before the kid was brought in or yesterday at the very end of the day when he had her. So I'm hearing things too because that's a defense here that this, this, these injuries happen at a different time. Okay, so if that's the case, let me stay with you on this, Linda. What is the biggest issue for the defense? What do they have to, to, to look out for when the prosecution is making their points? That everyone is going to point to the fact that nothing has ever happened with this child before, and the only time the child's ever had bruises on her knees, on her chin, is all, is when she's with the babysitter, came home from the babysitter. That's what the defense has to worry about, because then it's a push down on the, the concrete as opposed to a fall. And that's, Excuse me, I didn't mean to assault my, you. Michael. Yes, I, let me right make right. a note of that. I think we've just had an assault on the this, this set here. Uh, Michael, so taking that same tact, then uh, what is it that you're looking for from the prosecution that's going to make your case easier? I know the jury wants to know, well, if not your client, who did it? How did it happen? Well, if, uh, if I, from the prosecutor's perspective, you have to zero in on the conduct that is clear with this, uh, with this defendant, and that is the statements that she's made, acknowledging that, in fact, there was a, there was a fall. Uh, the, and the type of conduct that you can use to corroborate the nature of the injury. And uh, Linda and I were talking earlier about the fact that the fall that's being described here may actually be consistent um, with a uh, type of normal um, a fall as compared to the type of injury that was being right. described here. So uh, if I'm the prosecutor, I'm just going to zero in on what she said and try and corroborate the nature of the injury um, uh, to demonstrate the medicals corroborate that. And injury. I know medical testimony is going to be key in this Absolutely. case, obviously. Linda, let me ask you one final question here. Uh, what does the, the defense have to do to make sure they don't overwhelm the jury with too much medical testimony? They've got to keep it simple that this is, the theory is somebody else did it, i.e. the father, and that this injury could have been, the death injury could have been caused at another time, not just at that time that the babysitter had the child. And that's going to be critical. We'll find out how that plays out. Thank you very much, Michael Bachner, Thank Linda Kenny Bodden. I appreciate the uh, visit, and we'll do it again soon. Thank you for chiming in here. Appreciate it. Well, that's it. Thanks for watching the Daily Debrief tonight. Join us again tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern for Law and Crime. Live coverage of trial testimony begins tomorrow. Have a good night.